are, we have three. The first is to prevent new introductions um, of invasive species to the region. The second is to rapidly detect and eradicate any new infestations that get through our prevention strategies. And then lastly, we do have, um, we do manage some existing priority infestations as well. So that everybody's on the same page, I always like to start with talking about some of the different terms that I use with invasive species. So um, a native species is one that was in the region pre-European settlement. A non-native species, or some other words that you might hear are exotic or introduced, is a species that was either accidentally or purposefully introduced to the region outside its historic range. And so that can, it can be a species that's either from North America or from Europe or another continent. The next one, invasive species, is a non-native species that has certain characteristics. Either it rapidly reproduces, it tends to displace native species, and it has to have some sort of harm, whether that's to the ecology, to the economics, or to, the, or to society. And then a last yeah. term that we sometimes use is nuisance species. And that's one, it can either be native or non-native, but just one that interferes with human activities in some way. So why are some non-natives invasive? Um, there, we, see, we see a trend of um, different reasons for why some invasive or some non-natives do become invasives. And one of the main reasons is that when it's brought here from a different region, it's usually brought without its predators or parasites um, or diseases that help keep the population in check. Also, they're often very good at either reproducing or producing a lot of seeds. For our plants, we see multiple ways that they could um, reproduce. So for my example photo there in the middle is hydrilla. And it actually has four ways that it can spread. It can spread both by fragmentation of the stem. It has little potatoes called tubers that it can um, spread by. It also um, can create seeds. And then lastly, it does also create terrines or little overwintering buds that can grow into new plants. Usually we see invasives are generalists in that they can live and thrive in a wide variety of um, habitats or temperatures or you know, water chemistry. And then lastly, um, they're also really usually good at monopolizing resources. So on, um, with aquatic invasive plants, what we tend to see is that they'll grow into these thick dense mats across the surface of the water and then um, they'll monopolize sunlight so it'll shade out the native species underneath. I always like to highlight the benefits of our native plants because when we talk about invasive plants we talk a lot about its impact on our natives. And so our native plants are important in providing food for um, others in the food web. They're important in providing shelter and spawning habitat. They produce oxygen uh, in our lakes and rivers. They protect the shoreline from erosion. They stabilize sediments in the bottom of the lake. And, in the, and for that reason, they, they're important for reducing turbidity or increasing clarity in the water. They transport nutrients throughout the system and they also support biodi or biodiversity. You can imagine you have a lot of different um, native plants. They, have different, they create different microhabitats for other organisms. Our ecological impacts of invasives, right? if you can imagine in a lake, you have a nice, clear, nice, beautiful, clear lake like this. And if you get an invasive such as Eurasian water milfoil, we'll often see it creating dense monoculture beds. And there's a lot of impacts that come with this. We see a loss of biodiversity. Um, with a lot of invasives, we see disruptions in the food chains, which we'll talk about more later. As I mentioned, they create large mats on the surface of the water often, so we'll see decreased light as well as oxygen below them. We see increased sedimentation and nutrient loading when an invasive species comes in. And it also affects the pH and temperature levels. And then lastly, if we have a lot of plant growth clogging up a, a river, we do see impacts on our drainage and flood control. 
We also see economic impacts with invasive species. We see reductions in productivity, lots of impairments to, the rec to recreation. As you can imagine, it's hard to fish or swim through a big dense mat of Eurasian water milk oil. We see negative impacts on tourism for a region that's dependent on tourism, like the Adirondacks, that's very important for us. And we also see reductions in property value. A study done in Vermont showed up to a 16% reduction in property value when invasive came into a lake and became widespread. And for invasives, the cost in the US, and this is likely an underestimate at this point, is about 140 billion dollars each year. Our focus around invasive species is early detection and rapid response. And as volunteers, this is a really important part of where you come in into the work that's done. So what we try to do is we try to find invasives when they're early, when they've just been introduced into a lake and the population is small. So for example, I have a wetland invasive here um, purple loose strife. So if you can imagine maybe there's just one or two plants growing in a wetland, it's pretty easy to remove at the, this point. You can take your shovel and just dig it up. Um, there's not much cost and actually getting rid of it and succeeding in that is possible. But if we wait and let something like the purple loose strife um, expand, it might take over a wetland like this. And at this point, it, it the, uh, the opportunity to control it is, is just very minimal. It's gonna take a lot of effort. It's very unlikely. I do wanna highlight a few um, or thing, or I guess examples of early detection that we've seen in the region. Um, in 2007, European frog bit was found near, the, near Lampson Falls in the Grass River. And it was managed um, by APIP in 2007. We started managing it. At that time, we were removing 35 five-gallon buckets of European frog bit. And um, we're still managing it today, but at this point, when we go out, we, we are, collect maybe a half bucket, a half five-gallon bucket to a quarter or less every year. Also, uh, in, in the second and fourth lakes of the Fulton chain, in 2009, um, two small patches of Eurasian water milk oil were found. They were both, I believe, under an acre. And one of our partners, Paul Smith College Adirondack Watershed Institute, went in and hand harvested those. And it seems to be successful. We've done follow-up surveys in those waters looking for Eurasian water milk oil and have not been able to find any. And then lastly, we have a couple examples of water chestnut that were found when the populations were small. And we've been able to keep the numbers in those waters very low. In Loon Lake, it started at a population of about 100 plants, and we're down to about 40 plants that we found last year. And then in Lake Alice, um, they found about 10 or 12 plants that first year, and the last couple of years have found no water chestnuts um, with follow-up surveys. So that's really hot. just, I wanted to highlight that, that we focus hopefully on preventing the introduction of invasive species, but when some do get through, we hope to find them early when the population is small and we can do some sort of quick rapid response management and try to get it out of the system before it does become established. So in the Adirondacks and our program at APIP, we, we have um, six target aquatic invasive plants that we work with. And Larry will go more into the details of how to identify these. But I did wanna let the group know that um, we have a new tiering system of how we address aquatic invasives. And so for plants, we have three that are tier four or suppression. And what that means is that if this species is found, and there, these three species are the most widespread in the Adirondacks, um, our focus when we manage is more suppression to try to make sure that the impacts that they might have are, is, are, are mitigated. The next two European frogbit and fanwort are tier three species in our rankings. And those are focused on containment. Since these two aren't very widespread in the region, they're both only in a handful of lakes at most. Um, and so we're trying to make sure that they don't show up in any additional water bodies. And then lastly, water chestnut is a tier two species. So it's one that we focus on eradication. 
Um, we do have it in about four, or there's been populations in about four waterways in it, the inlands of the Adirondacks. Um, we do have a big population in South Lake Champlain, but the inland populations we're hoping to eradicate. And when I say eradicate it, that means remove it from, from those waterways. And then for plants, we do have one tier one um, species, which is not yet in the region, but that we hope to prevent it coming into the region, and that's hydrilla. For aquatic invasive animals, we have five tier three or containment species, spiny water flea, Chinese mystery snail, fish hook water flea, zebra mussels, and Asian clams. And then we also have tier one prevention species, and that's rusty crayfish and quagga mussel. So these are two species that aren't yet in the region, and we hope to prevent them from coming into the region. So in the Adirondacks, um, since the early 2000s, both volunteer efforts as well as partners and APIP staff have been serv serving the lakes for aquatic invasive species. And we found that of almost or over 420 lakes that have been surveyed, almost 75% are still free of aquatic invasive species. And so we have a lot of opportunity here in the Adirondacks to prevent invasives from coming into those uninvaded lakes, as well as the ones that do, are invaded. The vast majority, almost 100, have only one or two invasive species in them. However, we are a relatively uninvaded landscape in the Adirondacks. We do have a lot of sources around us. So the numbers that you're seeing here are big waterways that are surrounding the Adirondacks. And the numbers are the invasive and non-native species that are in these large waterways. And we know thanks to the work of our partners at the Adirondack Watershed Institute and their boat steward program that we do have a lot of people traveling from those waterways and boating in the Adirondack waters. So there is a lot of opportunity for bringing invasives in. With aquatic invasive species, our primary vectors of spread are motorized watercraft on, tra on trailers. Um, as we've seen in the literature and the science that with aquatic invasive plants, the, if we are able to inspect, and remove any attached plants, that's a very effective way to make sure that we're not spreading invasive plants. However, we do have um, potentially small invasive animals that might be attached to the boat or the trailer in different places or are in little pockets of water. And so we found with, with those that the most effective means of preventing their spread um, is to both drain any standing water in your watercraft or in your bilge or in your live wells or your bait buckets and, and let everything dry out very well. We usually say at least five days. If you're not able to let everything dry off, then you can visit one of the boat wash stations that are offered around the region, thanks to Paul Smith College Adirondack Watershed Institute. And you can find out more information at their website, adkcleanboats.com. Um, so for early detection, we have a lot of people out on our lakes looking for invasive species. And a lot of you on that call are, you know, that, that big team of people that we have helping look for invasives every summer. So we have a volunteer network that surveys as well as some professional teams that are out on the ground. Um, to show you over time the effort that's been going on to survey lakes for invasive species, every bar or the bars that you're seeing, the total bar is the cumulative number of lakes that have been surveyed each year. And then the red part of the bar is the invaded lakes and then the blue uninvaded lakes. And so we've been able to survey more and more lakes every year. Um, and we have you know, seen some increases in invasive species reports um, through, throughout time, but we're definitely seeing a plateau towards the end here. And it's really, you know, we're becoming, we're, we're getting the baseline. We have a good knowledge of where we do have invasives currently, as well as we have our great spread prevention network of boat stewards and decontamination stations through the region that are really helping boaters not, not to spread invasives. So as a volunteer um, for looking for aquatic invasive species, the role that, that you play is to attend a training like this one, 
to select a lake to survey in the summer. You do one, two, five, however many you think you can get out and survey. Um, we do the surveys mid-July to mid-September. And then um, we have different ways that you can report your data at the end of the year. And so I'll give more explanation of this later in the training today. We also have um, a professional team that we contract with every year to go out and do surveys. And so um, this will be the sixth year of this early detection team. And um, this year we're contracting with Adirondack Research. It'll be our third year contracting with them to do that work. In the past, we've also worked with Adirondack Watershed Institute at Paul Smith's for this work. And so each year um, we get, we've split the region into three subsections and each year the early detection team will focus on one of these subregions to do their work. And so this year they're focused in this northern portion of the park. We also have a project going on that's um, focused on lake mapping. So historically our maps have not been very detailed about both you know, the, the contours of the lake as well as the different habitats in the lake. And so this, over the last couple of years, we've been using a, so, a fish finder or sonar unit to collect sonar readings. We're able to upload those sonar readings into a cloud-based um, processing network called BioBase. And they're able to then create three maps for us. The first on the left there is um, the bio volume mapping. So it shows where in the lake we have aquatic plants growing. We also in the middle have um, the contour lines or the bathymetry of the lake showing us the depths in more detail. And then lastly, it gives us um, a substrate map showing the bottom hardness of, of the different areas of the lake. And then lastly, I know some of you on the, the call today are part of this project. We, over the last few years, um, we've teamed up with partners at the Adirondack Park Agency and the Adirondack Lakes Alliance and other um, lake associations and have been doing a project called Lake Management Tracker, which um, works with, with lake associations to assess whether, how effective their um, AIS management has been over, over time. And so what they do is they have a certain number of sites on their lake that they go and they visit each year, usually in the fall after management has happened. And they do a visual assessment of both the abundance of the native species are, that are at that site, as well as the invasive. And so they're able to quantify, you know, how many, how many beds of really dense mil Eurasian water milfoil do they have, for example. And the strength in this project really will be over time, they'll hopefully be able to measure, you know, to, I guess, see over time those abundances of the, the very high abundance be beds going down over time. And they'll be able to um, use that in different ways um, to help, help with their management strategies. So um, lastly, with this APIP overview, I just wanted to let everyone know that we do have a new website. Um, so I really encourage you to visit APIP's website at adkinvasives.com. Um, we have a lot of great resources up there for both um, about invasive species, how to identify them, and then also all the great work that's going on in the region around invasive species. We have um, a listserv that you can sign up for um, where we send out both information about events that are going on in the area as well as grant opportunities and um, any information we think might be helpful to, to our partners. And then you can also follow us on Facebook as well. And so I, I should have introduced Emily at the beginning, but um, we also have grown to a team of five full-time staff. And so um, Emily has just recently joined us as our communications and education coordinator. And so um, well, you'll be hearing more and more from Emily as she gets settled into her role um, with APIP. And so um, when you, whenever you, if you have questions to follow up after this training, I encourage you to both, you know, to email both Emily and I with your questions. And so with that, um, I do have a question that has popped up. And so um, the question is from Kathy. She asks, since there are several Loon Lakes, where is the one that I showed located? And so that Loon Lake is um, in the southeastern part of the region. 
um, near Chestertown. And so with that, I'm going to stop showing, sharing. Um, and if there's any other questions, feel free to put them in the chat bar box. And then I'm going to um, introduce Larry next. And Larry is going to give us a presentation on our aquatic invasive plants and then some of their native lookalikes. So welcome, Larry. Thank you so much for joining us today. And I think you're still muted, Larry. Oh, still, you're still muted. I don't know. There. Thank, thank you, Erin. You're a tough act to follow. Sorry about the muting. Let's see if I can share my screen with you. 